Sisters and brothers, welcome to episode three of the Pan-African Women of Faith webinars on the, pil the pilgrimage of justice and peace. This is one of five webinars held on the third Thursday of the month, which particularly reflect on the writings of Pan-African women in the Ecumenical Review Journal, volume 71.4. This is important because we encourage you to read the journal, which is available online, and to view the two previous webinars. The link will be provided. If you can't find it, just Google Pawin and WCC and you will find it. And we want to thank very much our chairs, Angelique Walker-Smith and Amelie Equil, and all of those who conceived of this series of webinars. We want to thank you all for coming and for being here. We want to thank our sponsors, Bread for the World, WCC, AACC CETA, 2021 Manchester Africans in Diaspora Conference. We're going to spend 45 minutes, more or less, together as follows. Opening remarks by me, the moderator, Reverend Dr. Evie Vernon O'Brien, prayer, then panel presentations, by Professor Dr. Isabel Apawo Piri, Reverend Dr. Lydia Mwaniki, and Reverend Robin Joyce. Then we'll have a panel discussion and the closing. And we invite you to put your questions and remarks in the chat feature so that we can respond. Now, this series of webinars is taking place at a time we can only call momentous. The world has once more awakened to activism to restore justice to all marginalized for their gender, their sexuality, their ethnicity, for whatever reason, and to bring restoration to our beleaguered planet. We pay tribute to those who have awakened the conscience of the world and we heed their reminders that if we do not act now, our world, which is already being stalked by the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Revelation 6, tyranny, war, famine, and pestilence will be entirely destroyed. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. In this week of prayer for Christian unity, when the church is racked with divisions, as much within denominations as between them, we must re-examine our faith and acknowledge that in Christian belief, God came to live among ordinary human beings, conceived out of wedlock by a peasant woman, born not in a palace, but in a stable, living as a refugee. In today's world, we would have stuck Mary in a home for unmarried women and buried her baby in an unmarked grave. Or he would have been torn from her arms at the border and placed in a cage. We would have put our foot on his neck. We would have executed him for insurrection. This is our world and we fight for justice and peace. I invite us to pray. As I say each petition, I shall pause for a moment. And in that space, I will invite each one to bring before God a specific person or persons that God has laid on your heart. At the end of each bidding, we shall remember the refrain, God in your mercy, bless our world. God in your mercy, bless our world. Loving God, we thank you for the leaders you have raised up for us in our nations. Remember them in your hearts, in our faith communities. in our local communities, 
give them wisdom, strength, and courage, and help us to give them loyal but critical support. God, in your mercy, restore your world. We give thanks for those who have gone before us in death. May we honor their memories and learn from their examples. God, in your mercy, bless your world. We repent on behalf of all people for those who have been victims of injustice and abuse. We lift them to you and we pray that we may work to bring about an end to all oppression. God, in your mercy, bless your world. Loving God, we offer ourselves to you that your spirit of love may shine through our lives. God, in your mercy, bless your world. Amen. And now, sisters and brothers, mostly sisters, which is all right, I'm going to bring before you our panelists. And I'm going to, we will begin with Professor Dr. Isabel Apawopiri, African theologian, renowned academic and ecumenist, she is the Deputy General Secretary of the World Council of Churches in Geneva. She is a Malawian by nationality and was Professor of African Theology, Dean and Head of the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics, and Director for the Center of Constructive Theology at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, Peter Maritzburg, South Africa. She served as editor of the Journal of Gender and Religion in Africa, and is a contributor to the Ecumenical Review Journal focused on Pawin. And her article was the imperative of diaconia for the church and theological education. Sister Isabel, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Rachel. And I also want to acknowledge you know, the organizers and those who are hosting and the moderator and those who have sponsored you know, these workshops. And I want to acknowledge all of you, sisters and brothers in the Lord. Um, I just want to start by saying that he, for Pawen to, to save, to save as a, the, the vision of uh, Pawen to save as a platform of academic study, spiritual reflection and action for women of African descent in all regions of the world speaks to a very clear prophetic understanding of what the church is in the world. In the spirit of the WCC pilgrimage of justice and peace and of the transformative diaconia, Pawen seeks to affirm and invite a deeper nurture of the community of women and men. And looking at my article that has just been mentioned, I argue that the most churches and theological institutions in Africa do not use the word diaconia, but they prefer to use social ministry. However, diaconia always carries the mark of kenotic service and embodied practice for justice and peace. So in this article, I try to look at diaconia both from a mission and evangelism perspective. But the section which I want to emphasize is where I talk about the diaconia in the Pan-African women's perspectives on theological education. I reflect on the WCC long tradition and strong commitment to a community of women and men in the church and society. I highlighted the commemoration of the 20th anniversary 
of the uh, of the culmination of the ecumenical decade of the churches in solidarity with women, which took place in October 2018 in Jamaica. Uh, the main objective of the commemoration was for the WCC member churches and ecumenical partners in an intergenerational setting to reflect on the achievements and challenges in building a just community of women and men to strengthen ecumenical collaboration in reading the signs of our times in order to map the future direction of the work of the WCC. In an inclusive community made up of women, men, youth, children, church leaders and lay people, we, lament, we lamented the continued experiences of violence against women and children. But we also shared stories of resistance and resilience in the face of gender injustice, which gave us hope for a better future. The spirit of Christian unity was visible as we received contributions from Young Women Christian Association, the World Student, Student Christian Federation, and the Student Christian Movement, and the Women's World Day of Prayer. We celebrated the fact that together with the World Council of Churches, these organizations have made it possible for women to become ecumenical leaders. Looking back at the marker of the ecumenical decade, we can reflect on what the ecumenical movement has done in a number of areas. The ecumenical movement has fought against you know, uh, gender-based violence. Uh, they have encouraged women's full and creative participation in the life of the church. And they have also emphasized on the global economic crisis and its effect on women. And they've also reflected on issues of racism and xenophobia and their specific impact on women. These themes are also central to the work of Paweni as we read the signs of our times and identify issues that we must address together through the ecumenical theological education. In the last section of my presentation, I also reflected on, you know, what do I see as a vision of um, a community of women and men that enables, you know, women's leadership in the ecumenical movement? And I say, I look, the first one was, uh, we, I, we shall agree to move together as the body of Christ to read the Bible with new eyes and no longer disagree on the interpretations you know, that we deal with issues of gender justice. I look forward to the time when there's equal participation of all God's people in all our ecumenical meetings. And I also look forward to the, um, to the time issues of gender balance and the leadership of the church should not be exceptions of few organizations, but that everybody will want you know, to include men and women in the leadership. And most of all, I'm looking forward to the time when there shall be no need for the Me Too movement or Thursdays in Black campaigns or the 16 days of activism for no violence against women and men. Because everyone in the church and society will respect women's bodies as sacred since women and men together reflect the image of God. And I also look forward to the time when men and women who are you know, champions of gender justice in the ecumenical movement will be treated with respect because they are fully, you know, fulfilling the vision of the ecumenical movement. And then I also look forward to churches empowering 
churches who are empowered and do not even use their, uh, do not even debate on gender issues. And finally, our vision of gender justice is inspired by change of heart that can only come as a result of true repentance and willingness to walk humbly with our God. And our liturgy in our churches affirm the humanity of both girls and boys as equal. And no one will be surprised that both women and men can be church leaders because the stone that represents discrimination has been rolled away from the churches and the society by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. And now we call upon the Reverend Dr. Lydia Mwaniki, who is the Director of Gender, Women and Youth of the All Africa Conference of Churches, before which she was a lecturer at St. Paul's University, Kenya. We're beginning to see a theme getting here. She's a post-colonial feminist scholar with a PhD in theology and gender from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, and an Anglican priest in Kenya. Her exceptional contribution to church and society as a scholar and astute advocate in gender justice in Africa received recognition by the Archbishop of Canterbury in 2020. She also, her contribution to the Ecumenical Review Journal is the role of African women theologians and the All Africa Conference of Churches. Over to you, Dr. Lydia. Many thanks indeed, uh, Madam Moderator, and greetings to all of you. As the moderator has introduced me, I'm the Director of Gender and Women at the All Africa Conference of Churches which is the largest ecumenical fellowship of Protestants, Anglicans, Orthodox, and African instituted churches in 42 African countries. I have been asked to give a synopsis of my article and then bring it into conversation with today's theme within the context of the week of prayer for Christian unity. My article is titled Enhancing Theological Education for Women in Africa, the Role of African Women Theologians and the All Africa Conference of Churches, AACC, and it can be found from page 492 to 496 of the journal. This article highlights the models that are being used by African women theologians and the All Africa Conference of Churches to increase women's chances in theological education, thus ensuring equal participation of women and men in church leadership. Mainstreaming gender into theological discourses has been a long struggle in the history of Christian tradition until fairly recently. Theology has been defined by men and in terms of God, God's relationship with the male gender. This gender disparity is partly because of selective reading of the Bible to deny women ordination to priesthood and senior positions of leadership in the church. One of the most influential texts is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7, which reads, a man ought not to cover his hand since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. In the history of Christian interpretation, this text, which actually excludes woman from the image of God, was taken up by future theologians after Paul to mean that since woman is not the image of God, she cannot represent the male God. This passage reinforced, this passage is reinforced by other passages that forbid women from speaking in church, such as 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34 to 35, and 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 to 12. Such biblical texts 
reinforce similar traditional beliefs, especially in many African cultures, patriarchal cultures, where traditionally women do not assume authority over men. Consequently, since traditionally theological training is linked to ordination in many mainline churches in Africa, there have been fewer women enrolling for theological education than men. AACC, through its strategic plan and programs, African women theologians through the circle of concerned African women theologians, and of course many other actors have lamented about this discrimination for many years and taken various actions to redress the situation. Consequently, although a lot still remains to be done, there is hope in that there we are witnessing an increase in the number of women doing theology and those joining the ordained ministry. The most current good news which we may all have heard, which has come as healing in our lament, is that the Anglican Church of Kenya has made history by appointing the Reverend Canon Dr. Emily Onyango to the position of an assistant bishop this month, January 2021. And that is that eight years after the first woman was ordained in Kenya in 1983. One of Apostle Paul's images of the church is that the church is the body of Christ. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is a powerful image which calls us to celebrate unity in our diversity, like parts of a body, of a human body, where each part of the body is valuable and unique. Each part of the body functions for the welfare of the entire body. If we take women to be the hands or the feet of the body, for example, the church would regret the many centuries it has crippled its hands and feet against the will of God, who has graciously given these parts to edify the church. Denying women theological education, ordination, and senior positions in church leadership is equal to chopping off some parts of the body deliberately and then continue to assume that the body is still functioning normally. It is denying the church the unique gifts and talents that individual women bring to the church. In this week of prayer for Christian unity and beyond, church leaders need to consider promoting scriptures and theologies of gender justice as a matter of priority and remove all other barriers, including class, race, and ethnicity that work against the unity of the body of Christ. A significant text here is Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, which has already been quoted by Professor Piri. And from this text, male and female are created in the image of God, hence are of equal status before God and have been empowered equally for service by the Holy Spirit. Thank you for listening. Amen. Thank you, dear sister. And now I invite the Reverend Robin Jones, whose public theology research engages the intersections of faith, spiritual belief, spiritual practice, and the direct correlation of these values on public policy, women's issues, and sustainable governance in the US. She is the founding director of Daughters of Faith Network a faith-based organization focused on spiritual renewal and justice advocacy. Currently, Sister Robin is a doctoral student at San Francisco Theological Seminary. Her contribution to Pawin, the Ecumenical Review Journal edition is, While We Wait, The Foolishness of Scarcity, The Devalued Other and Pedagogies of Becoming, a socioeconomic reading of Matthew 25, 1 to 13. Sister Robin, over to you. 
Good, good day, everyone. It is indeed a pleasure to join you and to um, be able to gather uh, so that um, our vessels can be um, uh, restored and renewed as we go forward in this season of great loss and great calamity. I think it's very important that we uh, put on our lens of hermeneutical uh, interpretation that really reflects um, part of the theme of the Poeen uh, uh, webinars, which is the notion of Sankofa. Uh, Sankofa is a cultural call to remember, to embrace memory, the necessity to move forward and to move forward into a future with hope. This is very, uh, resonates with the Christian experience and our expectation of living fully, although we are now near into the beloved kingdom of God. I want to open uh, my dialogue with you uh, from some words from uh, a young woman who took center stage uh, at the uh, inauguration of uh, President Joseph Biden and President and Vice President Kamala Harris. Um, her name is Amanda Gorman. Amanda writes in this poem, all at once I am my own daughter, mother, grandmother. I am in a rocking chair, womb and crib. I am the rocking chair, womb and crib. I am both victim and healing lady of the moon. If I can hold myself together, then I'll just hold myself for my own sake. And that poem comes from, those stanzas come from her poem, How I Con Convince Myself to Love Myself. And I think it's very important that the way that we engage our understanding and interpretation of scripture has to be very has to resonate from our own personal experience. Um, that's what I did when I took a, a, a lens of looking at the parable of the 10 virgins from a very socioeconomic perspective. How many of us have been um, on, on that side of the five who had great desire, uh, who wanted to go to college or to to be able to um, do things that required substantial economic investment. And we had all the necessary assets. We had vision, we had desire, but we were running short on um, financial resources. And so I think it behooves us to be able to speak and look at the text from those kinds of perspectives. I want to talk about what I believe now uh, in this season and uh, of COVID is that we have to embody a hermeneutic of hope. A hermeneutic of hope is a deconstruction of barriers that keep the devalued other from seeing or experiencing her fullest potential. The hermeneutic of hope is a praxis of knowing through the lens of faith God's intervening, God's interruption, God's showing up to declare that the kingdom of God has come near. It is, this is a creative, generative vision that uh, promotes and assures that justice and equity and wholeness comes to its fullest potential in those who are most vulnerable in society. My article, when I sat down to really uh, read that scripture and look at that, that pericope, pericope of scripture from um, Matthew 24 through 26, I got a sense that this was really about money matters because it opens up with um, the call to be able to find additional oil. And so, um, it is real important that we look at those kinds of narratives, those parables that are really teachings on perseverance. 
And that's what hope is. Hope is expectation, even while we persevere. Perseverance in the midst of inequity and in the denial of a share of resources. The parable begs through the voices of women, where are the reserves for the poor? Uh, it is, where are the reserves for the under-resourced? I think in the Matthean gospel that there's such a, the, the miracles themselves are really um, examples of the largesse of God. And so we need to be able to embrace the fullness of what Jesus was enacting in that, in that whole gospel, in the Matthean gospel, in, in ways that do not marginalize the, the five women who were considered foolish because they ran out of oil. They all came to, uh, to the banquet. They all came to go into the wedding procession, but they ran out. They all went to sleep at the same time. They all had their lamps uh, lit, but they ran out of resources. I don't know about you, but there's been spaces in my life and places in my life where I have actually um, had uh, more month than there was money. Um, I know that we have all, uh, we've seen a global financial crisis where there were major foreclosures. So we can, our own experience, our, our own experience speaks, I believe, into this particular parable. Um, African women, uh, we have Pan-African women, we have a response that we must answer, a, a response that we must give. We must consider, are we the ones who are being part of the dislocation? If we do not answer the call to share our oil, to share our resources, then we are part, an existential part of dislocating the most vulnerable. As it relates in this season of COVID, um, we have to be able to take a look at th this catastrophic moral, moral fa failure where the wealthiest of nature, nations are receiving uh, the most um, vaccine to distribute to their population. While nations uh, that are, um, do not have the kind of financial resources to be able to purchase and to be able to provide to their population, they are the ones who are suffering the most. And I think that when we approach the biblical text in these days, it is paramount, it is very profound that we take a look at who is receiving and, and where are the inequities uh, uh, of, of not being able to receive these life-sustaining and life-giving vaccines. And finally, I just like to be able to close to say that hope is the embers that spark from the fire in our souls. Hope signals that one is alive and living in expectation. So you may ask in this hour, where is the living hope? Well, I'd like to lift up Dr. Kazimika Corbett, a Pan-African woman who grew up in North Carolina, uh, who uh, studied at the University of Maryland at Baltimore campus, uh, who got her PhD at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which is my alma mater. Uh, she was, she's a viral epi epidemiologist. She is the lead scientist mm -hmm. and researcher that led to the research and development of the COVID vaccine. That's where our hope lives today as Pan-African women um, of faith. I'd like to lift up the uh, Gracia, Gracia Michelle Foundation and the work that they are doing with economic, uh, uh, found, uh, economic stability and growth with women in, in um, Southern Africa. They have a, a chain of values that the women have now come together to be able to scale up their businesses, 
and they're, they're sharing those resources and they're sharing their own leadership within their circles so that their oil will not run out. And if someone has um, reserves, then they can give back to someone within that circle. As we await the coming and the return of that glorious day, when the Lord shall come and do the great examination, I think that Jesus gives us uh, an example of what we as women of faith and should be able to engage and look at. If we run over to Matthew 26, he gives us the, the, the narrative of the woman with the alabaster jar. And what that, this woman came into a place of alienation. She was in the home of the leper, but there was Jesus. She bought all that she had, her most costly orange, orange, um, perfume, and she ministered to Jesus in the midst of his own loss and in the midst of his own worries as he was facing Jerusalem. She came in that midst of alienation against all who were questioning whether she should be there or not and what she was doing could be used for something else, questioning her gifts. But Jesus said that what she has done for me is of great value. And because she did it for me, what she has done should be known through perpetual, through eternity, that it was a good service. And so my hope and our hope of head, heart, and spirit of the Sankofa spirit, that we like the woman with the alabaster jar will bring our very precious gifts and that we will expand the humanity and expand the accessibility for the least, the last, and the lost. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Robin. Now, we have just a few more minutes left and I really welcome all of you, I thank you for your words of wisdom. I'm going to be a little bit unfair and pick up on, on just, okay, Sister Isabel, the whole notion of diaconia as related to mission and evangelism. The notion from Lydia that theology was defined in terms of men, and we rejoice indeed with the coming of an African woman as a bishop in Kenya. We mourn, even as we speak, that the first African woman ordained as a bishop in Swaziland, Bishop Eleanor, has gone from us because of COVID, and we pray for her. And Robin, thank you for referring to Sankofa, to, for expanding on it. And I praise you for quoting Amanda Gorman as we rejoice in the historic uh, U.S. inaugurations yesterday. Now, I'm going to ask each of you just to give two minutes to say, I think we, we hear our matriarchs. What is the one word you would say to our younger sisters in the, in the world, in the faith, as they continue in the struggle, as they take up where we, where we have contributed beforehand. Word to the youth. Um, who would go first? I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, I'd just like to reflect on something that really touched me that I think that would speak to the youth today. And it is a, a quote from Vice President elect then, but now Vice President of the US, uh, Kamala Harris. Harris said on uh, November 7th uh, in 2020, when they accepted the election, 
she said, tonight I reflect on their struggle. She's talking about those who came before her, their determination and the strength of their vision to see what can be unburdened by what has been. And she says, I stand on their shoulders. So I believe that this legacy that, that, that young people can take on and run with is that they can be able to see, begin to see what can be unburdened, what can be undone by what has already been. That in its essence is hope. That in its essence is expectation. That in its essence, as those of us who give Christian witness, is the prophetic movement of the beloved kingdom of God in our midst, not in its fullness, but our, our work to see that these burdens can be undone. Thank you. Sister Lydia or Sister Isabel, a word to the, the young. Wow, well, I, I think mine is still uh, what Robin has said. The word is uh, determination. And I will cite Paul's words, pressing on towards the goal. And in our, in our culture, we say that you do not stop planting until the crops germinate or have germinated or have grown until they are harvested. So we, we have to press on, and especially those who are behind us. We have already paved the way for you, young, young people, and we have fought most of the battles I'm not so saying that it will be smoother for you, but at least we 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 have done uh, greater things. We have fought several battles and and mightier battles than you will you you will ever fight. So press on towards the goal and don't give up and be assured that God is on our side. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Lydia. And Sister Isabel. Yeah, I want to start by a, an African proverb that was shared by John Beatty at one of the meetings that I attended. You know, because our, most of Africans are a rural farming communities. Uh, they talk about farming. So he was talking about um, a proverb which says to rest a hole does not mean that you have finished farming. And I'm thinking about uh, the gender justice struggle that uh, when we rest the whole, the, the whole, it does not mean that it's over. We have achieved you know, several things. We have seen many women you know, being ordained and many of us you know, actively involved in the ecumenical movement we should not be contented by what we have achieved because these are just you know, small milestones. There's still more work that needs to be done. So I, I would encourage you know, all of us and especially the young people not to be contented, but to continue because the battle is not over yet. Amen. Thank you. We're coming to the end, and I want to just draw attention to a comment um, from two of our participants. Please tell our youth not to be misled by false unity and false speeds. Mm -hmm. And another participant says, and tell the wise elders the same. And I think that's a very important statement. And to say to our young people, we are with you. We have not withdrawn, we are with you. And I invite us to join again for the next of our third Thursdays on February the 18th, when we look at reimagining the future. 
sisters and brothers, it has been wonderful. We ask you to, um, if you want to, and to tell others to look at this on YouTube, it'll be there. We're asking you also to open your cameras in a minute so we can see who you are. And I leave you with a Jamaican benediction. And if you don't understand it, find a Jamaican and ask them. Walk good and good doppy walk with you. Amen. Amen. Good. <laughs>